Thank you very much, Robin. And it's very lovely to be here after being at the Whitworth to be in this beautiful library where we're hoping we can get the lights turned off for the film. But in the meantime, I'm going to do a few poems, uh, recite a few poems that connect with music. The film's about my relationship with music and the relationship between words and music. And I've found a number of poems. So when you actually look and you suddenly realize, oh yes, there's quite a few. So this first one is from looking at Kitty Wakes and looking at Kitty Wakes on Bempton Cliffs on the east coast of Yorkshire and from this poem a string quartet was made because you'll hear it's about the sound of the Kitty Wakes and how they sound like a bow across the strings. Voice, cry, call. Imagine if they invaded Leeds in March made the hedgerow their cliff face, cemented nests on every ledge, how you'd never hear yourself speak above their din, truckloads of sound emptied out on every corner, crackle bicker of shriek, kitty wake, kitty wake, kitty wake, Every car alarm in the multi-story triggered, echoing the concrete floors while the flocks scrawl, kits rule in guano on every wall and door. You'd soon become desperate for August when the thousands would take off, cross the ring road and cooling towers, head off over the wolds, to the coast, fly over a lad in a wetsuit who teeters on a ledge at Flambra Head. They'd head out to the North Sea, beat off the slap of rough storm. They'd scrape their unrosined bows across the growl and snarl of waves while we cleaned the stink from the city and learn to talk human again. Second poem, it's a quiet poem, it's a sonnet. Um, it's got a northwest connection, and it's about the composer, Thomas Pitfield, who taught at the Royal Northern, and was also a very amazing wood engraver, pacifist and activist, was involved with all sorts of things. I didn't know him, but um, my father used to work at Dunham Massey Park and in his last years Thomas Pitfield lived in Dunham Village and walked in Dunham Massey Park. So when I found out about Thomas Pitfield's walks in Dunham Massey, I wrote this. Tree Lines, Thomas Pitfield, 1903 to 1999. Last Walks in Dunham Park. Your sight thin strings, far mist of fallow herd, gnarl bowl close enough to touch. You bend down and roll your fingertip back and forth, count annual rings, look back on 96. That long sing of notes and art that grew from the folder roll of a toy stage to the fine control of a flute sonatina, a tender carving of wings. Your many talents served a long fibred creed. Peace be to the people through engraved rain and the compressed music of a January wood. You knew how to stand in the presence of leaves. This softened marks cut across the grain as you worked the tree for the common good. My father's a musician and um, that's one of the reasons, although being a son, I rejected classical music for a very, very long time. But that's one of the reasons that I'm involved with 
music, and this is about my father and music. And it's called Age Quod Agis, which is Latin, but it means do what you do, or in modern parlance, just do it, I suppose. So the trainers. My father should have been born in a Venetian church, ringing with unkeyed trumpets, not round the corner from the brickworks. This organ maestro did what he did, con gusto, con vino rosso, with sheer bloody mindedness, with diapason and great swell, punching divots into the keys until the ghost couldn't take any more and knocked him off the stool. He wasn't one for standing in corridors and conducted TV repairers and family doctors who shuddered with Handel. He showed remarkable fortitude in the face of mad people in Max who leached him after service every Sunday. During incurable middle age, unbearable fireworks went off in his skull. He lay for weeks on the bed covers. Then painful gusts blew his life down river to the sea eagles who dropped him from a great height into a country house where he ironed newspapers and someone poisoned his golden retriever. Long before he died, he rationalized his books, but wanted Proust back, the whole box of doing nothing, something he had never experienced, though he could make a good cake if there was a competition. His mellowness arrived gradually until his salted, hard center dissolved in the cascading strings of Annunzio Paolo Mantovani. He potted geraniums and ordered books on European Gothic, still eager for a truly musical grandson and the hard-skinned cheeses of Northern Italy. So we'll go briefly to Northern Italy, to the island of Torcello near Venice, where somebody is playing the very beautiful Santur, the Kashmiri dulcimer in the shadow of the basilica. Torcello music. In the pillared shade of the basilica, a pony-tailed grey hair tip-taps his Santur with two walnut mallets. And from this quiet Kashmiri dulcimer, he sets free a roost of darting notes, like a skein of loose silk against a wall. Interrupted by the priest, permesso, his smile, his teeth, and calmness, unruffled by this bulbous busybody. He plays on, lover of gentleness, we close our eyes as he inks a perfect calligraphy in the haze. So, uh, I Am the Ferryman, which is a film about my relationship with words and music and the relationship between words and music in Benjamin Britten and William Plumer. William Plumer, it's interesting what happens to poets. William Plumer was a best-selling poet who was spoken in the same group and almost in the same way as Auden was. And now I don't think many of us know William Plumer at all. Um, and he's also a very fine librettist who wrote the, libret the libretti for Benjamin Britten's Curlew River and for Gloriana and for the Burning Fiery Furnace and the other church parables. So um, the story, we will see the story in the film. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see the film. Um, the story essentially is a woman has gone mad because she has lost her son who has been kidnapped. Kidnapped by troops, essentially, soldiers walking through um, who've taken him away and he dies and she sets off in search for him and the opera begins as she arrives at the place where he died. He's a 12 year old boy. That's all the story. So we're going to do a couple of pieces live with flute. 
Um, there's a series of meditations in the film. The film's in two sections. The first section is kind of autobiographical, which is me talking about relationship with words and music. And the second is a series of what I call meditations, which are poems with music from our liberated winter on the film, on flute and piano. Um, which are to do with aspects of the relationship between words and music. This first one is called Cries of Wild Birds. We travel through our own mud to listen to birds. We cross our own marsh to get closer. Because we have learned not to listen to birds, we refind them with plodding difficulty. And when they rise up right in front of us, we flinch at their differentness, though their cries are scored deep inside us. Birds in the sky, writer's words of this world, not of this world. Paradise and vicious exile. Between the lands of East and West. Both bamboo and silver, a lyrical flute sings a confluence of rivers. Each note carries the winds that blow from bank to bank. The sumida meets the curlew. The belly growl of Japanese stains the paired back English. To adapt, to understand the swirl and reach of both rivers is to make meaning for ourselves. As the sun sets, the wet corners of two writings overlap in the middle of the waters and their inks bleed, leaving wet, white paper on which the spirit of a dead boy is just visible. <laughs> 